Hello and welcome to Fresh Perspectives. My name is Gail and we have um, a special treat with us today. Uh, last, uh, on the last episode uh, we did some vegan food preparations and today we've got, uh, um, we've got Bill Kulik with us and he's uh, going to show us uh, a demonstration on making fermented vegetables. Um, but first I wanted to mention that uh, I believe when we were doing the, um, the program, the last episode with Ann Dinsha, and I was demonstrating how to get ready to make baked beans, I think I forgot to mention that uh, not only do you have to rinse them before they are soaked overnight, uh, the beans, uh, but you also need to rinse them again some more just before you cook them. It helps to uh, make them more digestible and I was talking with Bill about this and he said that uh, he came up with some other things that help to make beans more digestible. So thank you for coming on today, well, Bill. Thank, and thanks uh, for uh, honoring me to come here again. And uh, so why don't you tell us what your tips are for? Well, um, I, I've I've read for a long time that uh, putting a little bit of, of acid is like an old traditional uh, method for helping the the beans become uh, more digestible. Uh, so the way I do it for every cup of beans after they're rinsed and then when I'm soaking them I'll add uh, one tablespoon of either lemon juice or lime juice and that acid helps to uh, uh, make the beans more digestible but then again like you just said uh, drain that and then rinse them after usually overnight uh, soaking or 8 to 8 to 12 hours of soaking but then um, also uh, I skim the foam once mm -hmm. it starts to boil, I want to skim the mm -hmm. foam off because that's supposed to help with the digestibility and also to keep the gassiness down. But uh, also, uh, once I get the, the, the um, foam skimmed off, I will add, um, like to each cup of beans, and usually I do like three or four cups at a time, I will add one whole bay leaf and to the whole batch, one piece of uh, kombu, uh, seaweed which is a, an, an Atlantic kelp and uh, I know uh, that that is supposed to help to um, uh, break break the beans down and make them more digestible also but um, I, I know we talked on the phone about this but there's there's a word and I don't know what the word is but in Japanese they say the longer that you cook the beans with the kombu in there uh, and the closest um, translation to the definition of what this word that they use means is it creates more deliciousness uh, to the uh, to the beans so uh, I, I always use the the kombu and uh, and uh, now you do you use a salad piece then and not a powder yeah I usually I buy it it comes in, in I get two two different brands I, I uh, can't tell you what they are but one comes in a smaller package and they're in sheets inside of that and then uh, the other one it's they're they're in sheets but sometimes they're more like kind of wrinkled up uh, I, I think that might be like Maine coast might be the uh, the other uh, the other man but you know whatever type of kombu you uh, you choose to use so okay um, shall we uh, go ahead and show that diagram yeah yeah I know you wanted screen, to talk about so that yeah you can describe to people how these are used yeah so I I actually have a very similar crock to what is uh, on that um, um, diagram but uh, as you're looking at it uh, the way it works is the the bottom part where it says the cabbage and salt is in there in that crock that's a ceramic crock uh, mine that the, the one that this is from uh, comes from Germany also and the one that I have is that way too but you see that the cabin and the salt are underneath the weights and it's, it's kind of hard to see like what those weights look like but mine actually look like if you can imagine a grinding wheel that's been cut in half so there's two halves to the wheel uh, so you're putting in like a like a half circle with a hole in the middle of it and then a half circle on the other side and then that weight presses down your vegetables and then um, when you and and, and I, I'll, I'll tell you too that I, I add no liquid to any of these things. Mm -hmm. It's just the liquid from the vegetables mm -hmm. when the when you put the salt to it that the so the liquid comes up. But um, so typically the weights will be at least partially submerged in the liquid. But by keeping the 
cabbage underneath the liquid, uh, you don't get the oxidation and uh, um, it, it actually turns into a better product. But then where you see those two little U-shapes at the top, I mean, this is, this is a cutaway view, obviously, of uh, what that uh, crock would really look like, because if we were looking at the actual crock, all you'd see is the crock, not the cabbage or the weights. But um, in those little U-shaped things, there's water, and I use about a cup of water uh, in mine, and then the lid, the crock lid goes on top of that, so it's kind of a, uh, like a, um, an airlock or you know, a, a gas lock, so the gases that the fermenting cabbage and salt create can release so that lid would come up maybe a tiny little bit and then bubbles would come out through the water but then oxygen can't get back in mm -hmm. so you would have more um, I'm I don't really know the science there but I'm, I'm pretty sure it would probably be co2 uh, that's uh, that's being uh, created and I have to tell you uh, it, you know I mean it's fermenting cabbage it smells a little bit uh, I, I have a friend that asked me for my kimchi recipe because mm -hmm. he, he would always bring me artisanal cheeses from New Jersey and I would trade him uh, my kimchi and then he asked me for the recipe one time and when I gave him the recipe he said well when do you put the vinegar in I said there's no vinegar in it he said there's no vinegar in it he said, why does it it's, like, it's fermented that, that's what gives it the sour taste but uh he, he's funny he uh he told me he did exactly what i i told him to do he said but boy he says it really started to stink so he says i don't know what i'm doing but i know what's right so he took the whole crock and dumped it into a colander and then rinsed it off and then put it back in and poured vinegar over it um, oh, no. so he <laughs> kind of destroyed all the health benefits of uh, oh, yeah. of, uh, of the fermented yeah. food so and that's that's part of the thing that I, I guess the reason why we do this not uh, because we like to ferment foods but it's it does in it, it actually makes the the nutrients I know in cabbage the, uh, it, it actually helps you absorb more of the vitamin C and the calcium that's in the cabbage. Like as if, if you were to just eat raw or, or cooked cabbage, uh, you could not digest the, uh, um, the nutrients that are in it as readily as they're somewhat pre-digested in these uh, um, fermented uh, uh, products. So, um, Now you said that this was a way uh, that people preserved food before Right. Uh, canning and uh, freezing right. freezing was invented uh, right. to preserve foods. Yeah, uh, and actually th this entire book, Keeping Foods Fresh, uh, it's uh, old world techniques and recipes. All of these uh, recipes are old European family recipes and uh, they, they all predate canning, canning and freezing. And, uh, um, I, I've, I've been using it for years. In fact, there's a kind of a unique recipe for sauerkraut in there um, where, and, and, it, and I, I've made the recipe and it's really nice, but you ferment the whole head of cabbage. You don't shred it mm -hmm. like I have here. And all you do is you cut the core out of the, the cabbage head and you, you pack it with, with coarse sea salt and they put, they put it in a 55 gallon drum oh. in, in the recipe. I, I've never made that quite that much. I don't need that much. But then what you do is you make what they call sarmas or, um, uh, it's a Hungarian recipe, but it's, uh, um, they're like pigs in a blanket, so it's like stuffed cabbage, oh. but the, the leaves are already pre-fermented, so it adds more flavor, and then they're, they're, they're softer, too, so you just peel those whole leaves off. And whereas, um, like, regular sauerkraut has more of a tartness to it, mm -hmm. um, it it's, it's a little bit zippier, I guess I would say, but uh, the whole head sauerkraut is a little bit mellower. It's, it's not quite as... Uh, as tart as uh, as the the shredded type, and then you just you know put your ingredients in there, roll them up, uh, and make them that way. I've I've made it with maybe like you know five or six heads in a in a like a five gallon crock or something like that, and, and it is nice uh, uh, to do that way. But uh, but yeah, some you know I mean in some of these uh, cases they were making their their products for like a huge family or oh, yeah. or you know maybe the whole neighborhood or something yeah. like that. But uh, but yeah, and and I know uh, you know we we talked earlier too that I mean these when they're fermented, there are uh, natural probiotics in these. And um, I have read that even just one forkful of any fermented vegetable actually has more uh, natural probiotic in it than an entire bottle of probiotics that, that you would buy uh, in a store. So, um, you know, it's, it, and, and I know we talked earlier, and, it, and it, they, they make uh, fermented beet juice, and I have done this before, beet juices and carrot juices from the vegetables straight out of my garden. Mm -hmm. um, and you can just, just juice carrots or juice beets 
and put them in the jar and just put your salt. I usually use a little bit of uh, probi a probiotic capsule per, per jar. Oh, um, okay. So, you know, the crock is nice. I mean, if you're going to do a lot more, but I mean, if you're not going to do a lot, I mean, you know, it, it just it doesn't take long to make like a quart um, canning jar full of it and uh, several, several different uh, ways you can do it. I mean, this, this is actually uh, from a, um, um, I, I can't tell you where, but this, this has an airlock on it just like that. Um, yeah, um, you can actually get lids like that yeah, that yeah, are this, already made like that. Yeah, this that is this was bought just like this. And then there's actually for your your kraut weight, there's this little glass um, I don't know what to call this, but there's it's it's a kraut so weight essentially. They're made special for that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But uh, another thing that I've done like with this one, I just leave the lid slightly loose so it's not um on tight because it would blow up uh, oh, okay. that way, but I leave it on just you know like tighten it and then loosen it just part of it and then just put it in a plate or something like that so if it does bubble over um, and then you know check it once in a while you might want to push it down with a fork just to make sure mm -hmm. uh, but but I think I mentioned earlier another method is uh, a half pint jelly jar will actually fit inside of one of these so you'd have to leave about what would that be half pint is a cup so about a cup less um, vegetables in okay. here, but you can use that. I do that sometimes to ferment my own hot pepper sauces. So you can actually ferment the vegetables in one of these jars. Right. Do the whole process in right. there if you don't want to make really yeah, big Yeah, if you don't want to make a lot. I mean, if you or you don't want to buy one of those crocks. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and if, you know, and the crock is nice if you're going to do a lot, but, mm -hmm. you know, especially if it's like, you know, one or two people or something like that. And uh, the, the first time I actually did this, I was actually doing just sauerkrauts, and I, I put it in a cookie sheet on the floor so if they they bubbled over uh it wouldn't uh mess up the floor or the countertop oh, or anything yeah. like that and then yeah. i always loved uh this um brand of kimchi that i used to buy and i thought you know i make my own sauerkraut i mean how hard could it be and so i just looked at at the label of the bottle of kimchi and it said carrots cabbage sweet peppers hot peppers uh garlic onion and leeks and ginger and I was like, well, I, I grow all this stuff except for the ginger. So I thought, well, how hard could it be? So I just used more cabbage than carrots, more ca carrots than peppers and hot peppers and just went down the list. And uh, when I just mixed it up in the bowl and tasted it, it was, it was very similar to what I was buying. And then uh, I just, uh, and that, I, I'm going to go into that just a little bit here too, but um, I, there is a recipe in, I think it's called Summer in a Jar. Uh, there's a two a different- Summer in a Jar? Yeah, oh. there's, uh, it's a book and it's, uh, it's all about preserving foods, but they, they say that in there, uh, there's two kimchi recipes, but they say that if you want to have more intense flavor to let it ferment for two weeks before refrigerating it, or you could let it go for one week. And I've done it both ways, and honestly, I like it better when it's fermented for a week because the vegetables are still a little bit crunchy. When you let it go two weeks, it's just kind of... Um, they're just kind of soggy. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, to me, it's just a little bit uh, overdone. But I guess you know anybody that wants to could experiment. S so after uh, it gets moved to the refrigerator after the week, or that's two? what I would do. Like like something like this. If I fermented it, you know, for for a week on my kitchen counter, I would just tighten the lid down and put it in the refrigerator, and that would keep for. I have I actually have kimchi and sauerkraut in my basement refrigerator in gallon jars that were done in the crock uh, to start with, and. Um, it, two years it'll keep uh, wow. um, fine. Wow. I mean again it's good to keep pushing the vegetables down and make sure there's liquid uh, mm -hmm. uh, at the top too. Um, but uh, and then you know so so this kimchi is what we're I'm gonna show you how to make uh, today and there's cabbage, carrot, uh, this is just a sweet uh, red bell pepper, this is a, a chopped habanero, uh, green uh, uh, onion, and this is a mixture of uh, ginger, and I'm using. Um, and you have some, some yeah, of the Celtic, some Celtic sea salt, Celtic sea salt with dish. all the all the minerals in it, and then th yeah, so this is actually fresh turmeric uh, that is uh, also mixed in with the ground up uh, ginger. So I, to to do this, all went through my food processor, except I, I hand cut the. Um, Mm -hmm. the, the onion and the uh, the red pepper and the, the habanero too. But uh, I just have a, a Cuisinart uh, food processor and I just put it on the slicing blade and uh, that went through. The, the carrots I did uh, cut into chunks and then quarter them before mm -hmm. they went through. And then uh, the ginger and the fresh turmeric 
went through the slicing blade, and then I took the slicing blade out and put the chopping blade in there, pushed everything down so it, it got mm -hmm. um, pretty well mm -hmm. uh, um, ground up that way. So, so this, this is what we have here. Mm -hmm. I did not bring powdered cayenne. This is, all this is is cabbage with some juniper berries and salt, and then this is just grated beets, uh, which I also added the ginger and um, turmeric uh, mixture, and in the end, just to zip it up just a little bit more, I added a little bit of, I get fresh organic ginger juice uh, from uh, 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 the co-op, mm -hmm. so. I wish uh, those of you watching at home, I, I wish um, the smells could come through into your television. Uh, like, like it smells so good. Like Emerald it, says, we wish we had smell-o-vision, right? It, it <laughs> smells so good here today with all of these ingredients. Well, should I, uh, shall I start to assemble this? And yes. Can, uh, show how it goes? Yes. Um, I'm not going to use all of this cabbage because I think it's going to be too much for this, uh, this bowl, but I'm just going to add, uh, so this, this is just a regular green cabbage. You, you can use, I have used uh, Napa cabbage uh, in the past too, so uh, uh, another option. And oftentimes when I'm making it uh, in the fall at home and I have, uh, it, I, I grow daikon uh, radish, uh, Miyashigi is the, uh, the variety, but they, I will grow radishes that are, are literally like, I don't know, three and a half inches in diameter and they're this big. So oh, yeah. to augment my, my uh, cabbage, I will add, um, I'll grate the, the, um, um, the, uh, the, the radish that way too. And, and in this, this is the kimchi cookbook. Uh, there's like, I think like 80 or 100 different kimchi recipes wow. and just just a real quick idea and this works really really good with that same same daikon radish I'll cut it into cubes of about like maybe half three quarters of an inch put the the sea salt on that and it will start to bring especially when they're fresh picked there's so much juice so much liquid in there that you will have a lot of liquid in there and then all you add to that is the juice of ginger and the juice of garlic to that and sometimes I'll be preparing a meal and I'll make that first and within five or ten minutes uh, you can eat that kimchi it's sort of a fresh kimchi if you want that to store a little bit longer they um, say to add um, just a little bit of vinegar to that so um, I think I'm gonna add the salt now so this uh, to to a quart um, typically a minimum of two uh, teaspoons of salt, and I'm using this Celtic sea salt, which is uh, it has a lot of a lot of different uh, minerals and uh, and uh, nutrients in it. Highly recommended. By That's health. a preference for you for the kind. Yeah, I mean to you use. can you can use kosher salt. It really doesn't matter. But I mean, I've used the Himalayan salt. I, I use like uh, a number of different types of salt. But uh, um, and then so we've got our cabbage. I'm just going to put this. Um, uh, shredded carrot in there and uh, of course we get the the nutrients and the color from that and then uh, this is just one uh, organic red red bell pepper and one this is this was just like one bunch of green onion and I I left the green tops a little bit bigger about an inch long and then when it got down to the the uh, the white area I uh, used a little bit less now or I cut them smaller, there's I'm something uh, early in the spring that I go out in the woods to dig up uh, people around here have always called them leeks but I guess they're really supposed to be called ramps ramps right yeah wild and um, I was just wondering could you make this recipe uh, with those absolutely you know yeah. I mean you could use you could you could ferment those I mean I actually there are recipes in here mm -hmm. for like young garlic where you can actually take the young garlic bulbs before they've really hardened down mm -hmm. and just cut the tops off them and ferment like whole bulbs of garlic oh. in in a crock and, I, and I've done that and, and it's it's unique I mean it's mm -hmm. different and it's uh, it's very tasty mm -hmm. but so this is just a mixture like I said this is uh, fresh ginger and uh, fresh um, turmeric and uh, I know we've talked on other shows about the uh, the benefits of turmeric I mean it, it kills non-small cell lung cancer it's uh, uh, um, anti-inflammatory I, I I probably mentioned this before but my one of my like go-to uh, beverages when I'm at home and uh, I don't want to drink something else is I will take um, cold water and I'll add the ginger juice lemon or lime juice 
uh, about a teaspoon of turmeric, and I, I do actually use a little bit of a uh, naturally um, um, produced, uh, like a, a sugar, like, uh, I don't know, uh, turbinado or some. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and then basically, uh, I just mix this around. So the salt's in there. We, uh, we put all these different uh, vegetables together with the salt. You just blend this together and um, essentially uh, after a week of fermenting, and, and I know a lot of people I think think that fermenting goes, happens in, in, your, in your basement, but uh, depending on your basement, like mine this time of year is a little bit cool, mm -hmm. which isn't a problem, but it's gonna take longer. But uh, a lot of times with these recipes, you wanna ferment at about room temperature, oh, for, room the, temperature for the first. That would be like maybe low 70s? Yeah, low 70s, the, you know, upper 60s. I mean, I, I would say like maybe 68 to, to 72 degrees or something like mm -hmm. that. But uh, yeah, you just blend this together, and, and usually, uh, I, 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 when I do it in the crock, I have like a huge. I have like I think it's a, a three gallon uh, stainless steel mixing bowl, and uh, um, you just blend it all together. Hope uh, that all the the, the salt is is well, uh, um, you know, mixed around there, and then uh, you know, essentially, this is what I did a week ago um, today to uh, make what is in this jar that would be. Uh, the first jar to my right or on the, the right. And, that uh, really colorful one with a spout on the top of it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, so actually, I made a little mess here, but um, would, you, I did, uh, would you like to sample a little bit of this? Oh, I sure would. All right. Well, like I told you earlier, I warned you this was uh, maybe just a little bit uh, spicy. spicy, but uh, I'll... Uh, I'll give you a taste, <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll have a little for myself, huh? just to just to show that I'm not trying to poison you. Oh, just just to prove that it's safe to eat. <laughs> now, typically, the way I would serve this, and this is what the the summer in a jar says that you should serve this with like rice, possibly some some oil with the rice, and a good cold beer, but. Uh, if, if that's not your thing, then... Uh, well, we're not allowed to have beer at the studio. So. Well, I mean at home, but like I said, a little bit zippy. There's um, one habanero pepper in, uh, in this... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I warned you. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be able to finish it <laughs> you don't have on to finish camera it. here. <laughs> as long as you don't have to run. run Maybe in, inside my... Um, my uh, lunch sandwich there you go. that I have later. And then I'll, I'll let you have a little taste of the, uh, the sauerkraut here too, which this is not spicy. It's just there, there's juniper okay. berries in it. And honestly, I have to say I was at the, um, at the store looking for uh, some ingredients last week, and I thought, well, you know, caraway seeds. And, uh, and I'm at the natural food store, and they have like hundreds of spices there. And I was like, I, I can't believe they wouldn't. They didn't have caraway seeds, um, so that's. But I was surprised they did actually have juniper. This is unusual tasting um, sauerkraut. It, it's completely different tasting than um, the stuff that you buy at the it's, store. It's kind of mild, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, it seemed to me like when I started adding the probiotic capsules. Um, to the fermented stuff, that I remember how I was saying with the whole heads of cabbage, that that um, seemed to take away the bite. Um, it seems like the the probiotic capsule also makes the that bitiness go away, so it's it's a little bit mellower. I haven't even tasted this yet, so here's oh, my first okay. taste. It has a very earthy taste to it. Yeah, it does. You're right. Would you like a little of the beet? Oh, oh, sure. Um, you don't yeah. have to um, do I another dish. You could put right. it in one, one of these. And like I said, I mean, typically when I when I do the the fermented juices, I um, I do add uh, turmeric powder typically um, to uh, my um, my fermented carrot juice. There's that, but I also, um, I will put ginger juice into that uh, also into the, uh, 
um, into my uh, my fermented carrot juice, but I also uh, oh, I do this. <laughs> just that there. Um, in the in the if I this is fermented um, shredded beet with like I said the ginger and the whole uh, fresh turmeric, but when I do the juice in this in the beet juice, I will usually put like black peppercorns, horseradish. And ginger, um, but then, like I said, in the in the carrot juice, usually ginger and um, um, uh, the the turmeric. Which you know, I mean, carrot juice is already kind of orange, so the uh, turmeric just is you know that bright yellow that makes mustard yellow. Oh yeah. I've been hearing lately; um, it's been making news. Um, that mustard um, helps to relieve muscle spasms or muscle cramps. Or Mu something. Mustard, prepared Mu mustard or mustard seed like? You can have the prepared, uh, they said, they say it works with the prepared uh, uh, yellow mustard. Right, right, which there is turmeric in that, but well that's the other thing too, I mean I was saying about the probiotics that we get out of eating these fermented uh, things, but it's, um, what I want to say is that why that is beneficial is it, it's, again, it's an immune system enhancer because um, I can't remember the exact percentage, but I, I think it's in the neighborhood of like 90% of our immune system is actually in our intestines. So mm -hmm. if you don't have the proper flora to digest the foods and you don't have that proper flora there to, you know, uh, uh, in, in your system, your total immune system is, is going to be uh, somewhat compromised. So not only do these things help with the digestibility of the, uh, of the food, it actually does improve your, your immune system by, uh, and, and, and there's, you know, I mean, we all, I think, know too that, I mean, cabbage in itself is, um, there, there's, it's, it's a very healthy uh, right, food right. Uh, in general, and I know uh, that, um, oh gosh, I, I want to say it, Susan Weed, uh, in her, uh, one of her books, she, which I was kind of surprised, she, she said that the number one vegetable to improve your immune system is cabbage, actually, mm -hmm. I, I would have thought garlic, but uh, she said, she says, cabbage is the king, garlic is the queen of, uh, oh. of all vegetables for uh, uh, improving the immune system. Yeah, um, actually, I've never really cared much for cooked cabbage. The only way I really do like it is either uh, raw in um, coleslaw or, or else as sauerkraut is mm -hmm. really the only <laughs> ways that I really even like uh, cabbage. It, it is funny, uh, somewhat recently I, I just started uh, really simply, again, just put the, the cabbage through, uh, through the food process, through the shredder, and um, just like some oil or butter, salt and pepper, and just, just frying that uh, like that is, uh, is, is actually really good. And um, uh, what else was I going to say about cooking cabbage? Lost my train of thought there. But anyway, uh, yeah, there, I mean, it, it is a, a really versatile uh, vegetable. I, 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 oh, that's what I was going to say. A friend of mine came up with a, a recipe for, it's, she calls it unstuffed cabbage. And so oh. it, it's like, Mm -hmm. you know, stuffed cabbage, except it's all the ingredients, but you would just shred the cabbage up or just chop it uh, coarsely, and then, you know, it's like, uh, you know, rice and cabbage and, uh, you know, spices and stuff like that, which uh, is, a it's, it's really good and, and much simpler. I mean, I, I was saying about that Sarmas recipe, I really, really like it, but, uh, you know, it's like kind of tedious. You have to roll each one of them up, put it in the bottom of the pan, and then, so after you've, you've done the fermented whole head cabbage and you've stuffed them and you put them in the pan, they actually recommend putting water or stock over the top of them and then you're supposed to simmer those for hours uh, so all those flavors kind of uh, oh. meld and blend together like that. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know how many years. I, I know at least in the neighborhood of uh, 20 years or so I've been, uh, I've been doing this. And, and it's not like my family did this. I mean, my, my, my parents used to ferment like, and, that, and that's the other thing too. A lot of people uh, talk about pickling 
and like making you know uh, pickled cucumbers. And I, I was talking to a guy recently um, about this, and uh, most a lot of people will just cut up the vegetables and put them in a jar and put like sugar and vinegar and spices in that, and then they feel that that's pickled. And in a way, I mean, and in, in this book too, I mean, they talk about there's there's different methods of preserving, but that's preserving. In vinegar, it's but you don't really get the health benefit oh, of the oh, fermentation oh, yeah. um, from from actually letting it uh, completely ferment. Um, and uh, I and I do make pickled cucumbers too with the fermentation, and it's basically mm -hmm. all the stuff: the the dill, the ca uh, the carrot, or the garlic, the onion, and I use tarragon and some other spices. But all I do is make sure that they're really really well washed, and then I boil. The water with a certain amount of salt in it, and then you put the uh, the boiled salt water over the the cucumbers, and again your kraut weights, and then you let them uh, mm. ferment like that. I actually use grape leaves, which have a little bit of tannin in them, um, which actually helps the the uh, the uh, pickles have a little bit that, that keeps the skin oh, crispier. Okay. okay, so this is like pickles except with the fermenting process, right? Right. Instead of the usual thing that people do, right? When they right. Pickles. And and I know too. Going back, I shouldn't be bashing my friend, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, he uh, he told me he says, well, he says, you know, uh, uh, Tabasco sauce is, is fermented. I said, yeah, I know. He said, yeah. He said, I make my own. He said, I, he, he said he cuts up the the um, the peppers and he puts them in a little bowl and he pours vinegar over them and he puts a, a piece of uh, cellophane over the top of it. And I said, well, that's not fermenting. And he he insists that it is fermenting, but. Uh, vinegar stops fermentation oh. because of the acidity, oh. uh -huh. and it's it's a preservative. So he's pr he's not doing anything wrong necessarily. He just doesn't it's understand. It's just not a fermented. He's, yeah, he's pr he's preserving peppers and vinegar. He's not. And so, like when I make like um, like I said, I, I make my own hot sauce. I will take the peppers, put them through the food processor, not pureed, but just sort of a mash. Um, and that was a recipe I got out of Mother Earth News years ago, but. Um, I would put them in, in a put the ground up peppers mixed with salt in a jar, ferment for one month uh, like that, and then I pour that mash through a, a sieve and uh, squeeze out all the juice. I keep the juice, I throw away the pulp, and then so after one month of fermentation, that juice that's in there is just the juice from the peppers. I didn't add any liquid to it, but the salt brings out the the, uh, the liquid. It ferments. And then after you strain that out, you put it in your bottles, and um, you add about a teaspoon of of vinegar to each bottle, shake it up, and then you let that sit on your kitchen counter for about another week to age, and that's where the the vinegar acts as a preservative. So, uh, I mean, there's recipes where you can, um, you know, there's things, I mean, I'm sure you've dried uh, fruits and vegetables and things like mm -hmm. that, too. Yeah. Um, you know, and just like keeping things in a root cellar also is a uh, another method of uh, of preservation. But um, uh, they 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 uh, um, preserve foods and sugar. I mean, you can you know like your jellies and jams mm -hmm. and things like that. If the sugar content is high mm -hmm. enough, uh, it, it's a mm -hmm. preserver too. Honey, you can preserve in honey. There's uh, I have a, a recipe that I really like for uh, uh, preserving eggplant that came from this book, I believe. Yeah. Um, and it's just eggplant preserved in oil, and oh. you, you cut. I, I usually grow the long Japanese or Asian eggplants, and uh, cut them into like quarter-inch rounds. Put them in a bowl similar to this, and there's a fair amount of salt in there. You leave them for, for six hours, and a lot of liquid comes out of them. But then I pack them into quart canning jars mm -hmm. with uh, black peppercorns, mm -hmm. bay leaves. Um, I used to always use uh, basil because I always had a lot of basil. The recipe calls for time, and I always say, well, whoever has enough time. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. but then some garlic and sometimes a hot pepper, but you pack it into the jar, and then you just top it off with olive oil. And typically what I would do is I would make that on a Sunday, and at the end of the night I would make sure I'd check the jars and sometimes twist them to get the bubbles to come out, sometimes stick a knife in there to get some of the bubbles out, top them off with oil. I leave them on the kitchen counter for overnight and I recheck them in the morning and then uh, again just top them off with oil put them in the refrigerator and that will store and again it's not canned it's not frozen but uh, it will keep for um, well over a year I've, I've had them oh, really? uh, keep that way too. Now um, 
All of the vegetables, in order to make fermented vegetables, they all have to be raw, right? Yes. You mm -hmm. don't, you can't cook any of it in order to. Uh, ferment not it. that I'm aware of. No, I don't know. And and typically too, I mean, you know, you don't have to. But I always use organic, and I mean, I I grew the beet, I grew the the uh, the cabbage. These are mine from my garden from uh, from last year. The Obviously, I don't. Well, I, I am growing ginger in a big pot right now. I've been I've been experimenting for years, and a friend of mine just gave me a piece um, of of uh, ginger plant that she had. And strangely enough, a, a friend of mine said, "You know," he said, "Sometimes if you just put ginger in a bag and leave it out, he said it'll start to sprout." The ginger will sprout. Yeah, so it, so just I, leaving it in a bag. Yeah, yeah. Huh. I mean, I tried it with turmeric. At the same time, the turmeric rotted, but the, the ginger <laughs> sprouted, and I was like, "Oh, well, I've got the, the plant that she gave me." So I planted that in a big pot, and then I took the piece that I sprouted, and I just thought maybe maybe the the turmeric I was using the the roots were too small. So um, I was at the co-op uh, recently, and they had some pretty big like clusters of uh, of turmeric. Uh, root. So I thought, you know, I've been wanting to try, I've been trying to do this for a couple of years. I, I read online like how to do it and they said to put it in a warm, dry place and so I just put it on my um, windowsill in my kitchen in the spring and it just dehydrated <laughs> so I oh. threw it away. But, uh, but you know, now that I've found that the ginger sprouted in a Ziploc bag, I'm, I'm opening the bag up every time I think of it and letting some fresh air into it mm -hmm. but keep sealing it off and I, I, I don't know, like I said, the the thing that I read online said dry and warm, but it seems like moist in the bag maybe helps it. I mean, mm -hmm. you would think like yeah. if, if ginger was in the ground, would it be dry to sprout? I mean, you would think there'd be some moisture, really? even if it's yeah. in the yeah. South Pacific or wherever ginger mainly grows. But, uh, um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm experimenting. I, I'm going to try to uh, grow my own uh, turmeric too. But, but yeah, so the, the carrots are mine. The, the cabbage is mine. I did buy the, the peppers and the... Uh, uh, the ginger and the mm -hmm. uh, uh, the turmeric that went in these, and the green onions. So I don't have green onions this time of year. Either. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, my husband. Um, we usually have uh, string beans in our vegetable garden every year, and you know how string beans are. They just keep coming. Oh yeah. Coming and coming, you know. Gotta and keep uh, he has a couple of different years. He has fermented uh, some of the um, some of the string beans. And uh, they are quite tasty, mm -hmm. uh, the fermented string beans. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've had. I've never done it myself. I, 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 in fact, it's one of the things where I don't know. It's sort of a, a mental block or something. But I, I, I rarely grow beans. Maybe it was because when I used to grow them, kind of more commercially, uh, there was so much picking to do. I, I remember having y like yeah, ten one hundred foot long rows in one field, and then uh, <laughs> another bunch in, a, in another field. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, at the end of the day of harvesting all day on Friday for the farmer's market, I'd be on my hands and knees for like two hours picking all the beans I needed oh, to pick for yeah. the, the market for the next day. But Yeah, uh, there, there is quite a bit to having string beans. Right, right. Yeah, there's that. You got. You can't say, "Well, I'll pick them next week." Either you've got right, to pick right, because they uh, keep getting bigger and then they get old and tough. Right, right. You know, if you don't keep them picked. Now, do you grow the pole beans or bush beans? We've had both. Okay. You know, some years we've had both. I've always, never. always the bush beans, but uh, mm -hmm. um, the pole beans don't seem to produce. Um, the as huge of amounts. Right, they're more longer. It's a longer season, though, because mm -hmm. I think with the bush beans, you get like flushes, and if you keep them picked, they'll keep on coming. But uh, they don't usually produce as mm -hmm. long of a season as the pole. I've never grown a pole bean in my life, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I just know this from reading. Just stuff. for that reason alone, the, uh, they're easier. Uh, the pole beans, right? Just you don't because, have to keep replanting. Uh, uh, you, you know, it it isn't uh, so hard to keep them picked. Right, right, yeah, well, and then I suppose if you have some some young people around, they can pick them for you, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't, and uh, you know, peas too, I mean, I, I love fresh peas in the, well, it's not really spring when they come in, but uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, I mean, you know, what are we just like, uh, I know this will air later, but it's, uh, what are we, uh, uh, I mm, guess, 11 I days away till the first day of spring. That's when I usually yeah. like to, to get my peas in, of course, you know, when yeah. we have like a foot of snow out there today. But uh, who knows what I have. I mean, what was last Thursday it was 60 degrees. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Before this uh, snow hit. But, uh, 
But uh, yeah, it, it is getting to be uh, uh, the season for uh, for planting here now for the the colder weather stuff. Yeah, I, I, I do have to admit I love to just uh, I could just go sit in the garden and eat peas. You know, yeah. <laughs> they're so delicious. Do you grow the snaps or do you grow um, the shell? Uh, usually the shell ones. Um, uh, I, I like yeah, I do like the sugar snap peas too, and. The sugar snap peas are really an excellent source of fiber. Oh, right. Y you know, uh, when you eat, you're eating the whole shell and everything. Oh, yeah. Thing. I like them. Now. It just seems like, I mean, I, I grew, somebody wanted the, the shell beans at one time, and uh, um, I grew them, but I, I just find, like, you, you have, like, a bushel of, of, of peas, and then you shell them, and you get, like, a bowl like this. And it just I seems know. like there's so much waste to them. Then, I know. Um, but they are very delicious, though, the raw. Oh, yeah. To eat them raw. Oh, yeah. It's a funny story. Uh, years ago when I was living in Ohio, I had this, this really nice crop of uh, sugar snap uh, peas. Um, and uh, my friends came from Syracuse to visit. So when they got in on Friday night, it was just, just getting to be about dusk. I'm like, come on, you guys got to come out here and try these. And I had this plan that for lunch I have a, a fresh pea soup recipe. And uh, so I went out and showed them, like, hey, check these peas out. And they tried them. So the next morning I wake up and my friend's wife is out in the garden. She's like, you just got me on those peas. She picked and ate every pea that I had out there. So it's like, <laughs> okay, I guess a uh, different plan for lunch for today, I guess. But, uh, yeah, I mean, she must have been, I mean, there was probably, I'm going to say at least a couple of gallons <laughs> worth of peas out there. But uh, but she ate, managed to eat yes, them I'm, all. I'm sure she was very regular after that. Too, but, uh, <laughs> Oh. Yeah, well, they sure do taste good, and it's hard to make yourself stop eating them. Uh, they just taste the very best when when they are fresh and raw. Oh yeah, being it's, and it's it's like that with a lot of things. I, I think you know a lot of people are like oh you know, you grow your own tomatoes. Gosh, when they're in season, you know you can get a whole basket of them for for a couple of bucks. But I mean, you probably know this yourself from your own garden. I mean, if you pick a red ripe tomato right there on the vine and eat it right in the garden. It just it's just so much more flavorful than if it you is. picked it and let it sit for even one day in your house. Right. I mean, it just doesn't have the. And, uh, and, and when they're ripe in the garden, there's an aroma that oh, fills yeah. the air. You know the and and it just makes the air smell so good. Well, and I often personally think that animals are in a way smarter than us. You will never see an animal eat a tomato that fell on the ground. They will always eat your tomato when it's on the, <laughs> the vine. One that's on uh, the they'll, vine. They'll they'll never pick it off off the ground or. Uh, you know, a lot of fruits uh, are, are in the, in the, like that too, which I know a lot of people try to like anthropomorphize uh, animals and the, I know people say, well, the, the deer like that because it's sweeter. It's like, did you ever eat a bitter nut, hickory nut? It's like, you, you'll bite into it. It's like, wow, that's good. And then you'll have that bitterness and that astringency in your mouth the rest of the day. Well, the deer will eat those. They're not eating them because they're sweet. They eat them because they're loaded with nutrients. And, and I have literally seen, I mean, you know, we all know lettuce is good for us, but I've actually seen a huge buck walk right through lettuce, right through the spinach to eat my Italian dandelion or my radicchio. Oh, the yeah. things that are in the chicory family yeah. have so much more nutrients. And they can, I think it's, I don't know how they sense it, if it's through their smell, but I mean, I, I know you, you probably know that a deer has a sense of smell like three to 10,000 times more powerful than ours. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think it's through their sense of smell that they, they can pick up that, um, you know, there's more nutrients in certain foods than uh, uh, than others, uh, but uh, yeah, and and uh, um, those we had some uh, for a while. We had some of those Italian dandelions. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody had given us some seeds one year, and with these particular dandelions, they'd actually just grow in the row where you planted them. They didn't. Right don't spread all over like the common. Right, they don't have that thick tap root of like the wild ones. Like yeah, 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 they don't. They just stay right in that row, row and you actually have to collect the seeds um, to save for the following year to right. plant right. in order to continue having them. But one year, one year, they just, it just sort of after uh, it just sort of fizzled out, you know, one year, you oh, yeah. know. Um, all of a sudden, 
it didn't work out anymore. Yeah, I've I've grown. Uh, the, there's the Catalonia special, which is just a big green one, but it, it's it's. It's actually not as bitter as the wild, I don't think, and mm -hmm. it's a little bit more uh, yeah, succulent. Yeah, it, it's almost more lettuce-like for flavor. Right, right. And I don't know if you ever had. I, I did grow it last year too. I had uh, the green, but I also there's the one that has the red ribs, so the the stem uh, part of it uh, that sticker is, is like a burgundy uh, mm -hmm. kind of a red. But I don't I don't mm -hmm. know if there's really that much flavor uh, difference. But but even with that too, I mean, when it you know to get back to the fermenting, I mean, mm -hmm. you could ferment. Uh, you know the your dandelion leaf. I mean, there's a lot of other um, foods that that can be fermented, and again, it's going to help your digestion. It's going to help uh, your immune system, and uh, you know you get all those uh, nutrients out of it. And uh, and it's also a very easy uh, way to preserve things. And like I said, it's not like that complicated of a process. Like I said, what we just did here. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, cabbage, mm -hmm. carrots, sweet peppers, hot peppers, the green onion. Uh, you don't have to put the ginger and the turmeric in it, but I think I, I like a lot of ginger uh, in uh, a lot of things that I make. Um, yeah, but, it is really good for digestion, ginger. Well, right, is, and yeah. it's an anti inflammatory too. You know, it helps with, uh, you know, arthritic problems, but. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, essentially, I mean, I mean, I, granted, I had everything cut up ahead of time, but what did that take? I mean, all we'd have to do is put that in a jar, put one of these lids on it, or put this lid on slightly loosened on a plate, uh, something like that, and then it's a week. I mean, you let it mm -hmm. sit someplace mm -hmm. for a week, mm -hmm. and then just screw the lid on and refrigerate it. And okay. I mean, occasionally, it's so not a bad idea to push the the vegetables down to keep the so the liquid on top. So just to clarify this, people who might want to try this. Uh, if they don't want to go with the crock, they can put it in um, the jar. Right. And um, and screw the lid on and then loosen it a yeah, little. Yeah, I keep it a little bit loose, but like I said, especially with any of these, I would put it in a plate or something to catch liquid uh, that comes off. This this was actually sitting in a bowl, and there was a little bit of liquid that, that bubbled over. I mean, it, you know, to avoid that, you could put less in it, but I never do that. Okay, so then it's like for a week? One week. At room temperature at right. about 68 to 72 degrees. That's what I would do, yep. Okay, and then you tighten up the cap and put it in the refrigerator. Exactly. Now, um, if you're using a crock, um, can you leave it? In a, one of those large crocks, can you leave it? A lot, I, I have. A I mean, there, there's longer. been times where I'm like, I just don't have the time. I got this big crock, or I'm out mm -hmm. of the big jars that I need. And I, you know, I've got four gallons of, of kimchi, and I, it's like I've got my jars tied up with something else. So I have a spare refrigerator in my basement, and I've cleared out an area and just taken the whole crock and set it right in the refrigerator mm -hmm. like that. So, mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. So it should be. Uh, if you're doing it in one of those large cracks, it should be moved to the refrigerator also. I would, I would, okay. to, to keep, you know, after a week or, or so. But, but the other thing is, too, like I said, you know, some of our basements are cooler this time of year. So maybe you would, you know, ferment for a week in the in the warmer place but I mean if you just have a cool place in your basement and you, you can, can set it you down there it the you know even if it's in the 40s it's going to slow the fermentation and then it'll uh, mm -hmm. uh, it'll last a little bit longer and I actually know I'm pretty sure when they talk about the fermented beet and carrot juices they talk about fermenting for one week at room temperature and then cellaring it for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. so it ferments more slowly at a uh, at a cooler temperature mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. uh, a couple of weeks afterwards too so and you could do that with any of these and you know it's really to taste i mean uh you know people can just experiment uh, on their own like i said the summer in a jar i mean they they talk about fermenting for 2 weeks uh, for for more flavor, and I didn't really find that there was really that much more flavor uh, to me. But the thing I didn't like about that was I it lo I lost the crispness uh, of the vegetables if it mm -hmm. sat for two weeks. But you know maybe ferment at room temperature for one week, and then you know uh, in your basement for another week or two after that. And uh, but like I said, it's it's you know it's all to whoever's taste, whoever wants, or whatever you're, oh, okay. uh, you're, you're making. Should we, uh, just in case somebody's tuning in late, should we show a picture of that big crack again? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, so essentially, I mean, that's like this, this jar that we have here. It's uh, now, the cabbage. Go ahead. Does, does it look like some sort of a base, or is, is that I, just I think I think the, that, that, bottom, that bottom line is probably your tabletop, and then oh, when you okay. see those two little dots, that's probably like a ring, like the foot, oh, okay. the, foot of the, the crock. Okay. And uh, yeah, and then, you know, you just have, it's all ceramic, it's all glazed. Um, 
But like I said, I, I, I was going to bring mine uh, okay, along. Okay, so I have this several. kimchi could be done in one of those. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the weights, like I said, it, it's, like a, it's like two half circles. Uh, it looks like a grinding wheel. It's got a hole in the middle, and then it's cut in half. And then, you know, so it, you know, because there, you can see where if it was the size that it is on top of the cabbage, it wouldn't clear the inner part of the lid mm -hmm. um, or the, the opening because uh, mm -hmm. the opening is narrower. It's not a straight up and down side oh, where I that see. where those yeah. little U's are on the mm -hmm. top uh, on the right and left of the crock uh, where the water is. Um, that makes the 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 inside a little bit narrower and it makes the outside a little bit wider but uh, it's a little bit of a narrower opening it's not just a straight and then uh, the cylinder. water acts as weight also does it? Um, well the, the weights keep the vegetables down and then the liquid comes up and and sometimes if you have like really really fresh juicy cabbage or whatever that you're putting in there um, I, I like to push down on them a little bit after everything's done to see some liquid come up, but I don't, I, like I said, I almost never add any liquid to it, but um, usually by the, if I make it on like a, say a Sunday morning or early afternoon, by evening I like to remove the crock and look inside, and I like to see that liquid at least halfway up the weights. Sometimes the liquid actually covers the weights entirely. Okay. But it, it's really just for oxidation. I mean, if these vegetables are not immersed in that liquid, they will um, tend to just get a little bit oxidized on the top. I mean, it's not bad. It's just, again, they get a little soggy when they're out of the liquid. And then again, the, the water that sits, and that's, you know, it doesn't give you the perspective, but those two little U-shaped things at the top of the crock where the water is, that's a, that's a trough that goes all the way around uh, the top. So then when the lid sits in water, uh, all the way around so then as the cabbage ferments or whatever ferments inside of there and produces gases the gases release through that water and out but no air can get back in so it actually helps them to ferment faster but it's a higher quality product when you're done so you don't have uh, oxygen getting them to them and, mm -hmm. and like I said too I mean if you don't want to get into all that another option is like with one of these jars that half pint jelly jar will fit right inside there and you can use that to push mm -hmm. it uh, mm -hmm. Uh, push it and, down. and these are readily available. The pieces, of the glass items like yeah. you have in that one that yeah, people I, could I buy. Yeah, I can't. I don't even. I can't even tell you where to get them. But I'm sure if you looked up, um, you know, you fermentation know, if you could, online, could get them. Um, it would be a good idea to have those inside of the jars. Yeah. But oh yeah. It definitely is. Yeah. It's, it's a. It's a lot simpler method. But mm -hmm. you know, I. I just to me. I, I go with the simplest. I mean, you know, there's a small cost here, but I mean, just the jar. I and mean, you don't have to have these plastic lids either. You can use a regular canning um, lid. Like a regular canning lid, but again, keep it just a little bit loosened so the uh, the gases can release. And then, uh, you know, I every couple of days open it up and I take a fork and I push it down and make sure that uh, the liquid is at the top with the little glass ring or whatever you call it there that uh, that weight. That does it for you, or like I said, a, a half pint jelly jar stuffed in there. I mean, you're, you're only going to get three cups out of a quart jar because you're putting a cup spacer in uh, inside of it. But um, you know that that works, and, and I mean, you know that there's half gallon wide mouth canning jars like this too. So you could actually do like double this amount uh, mm -hmm. um, also. But uh, but yeah, so you know simple small small batch i mean you know if somebody wants to start with something like this to experiment before investing oh, in, in, yeah. the, in the bigger crock yeah, that or probably whatever probably would be a good idea to go small to start with right right um but yeah i mean there's several different i mean those those crocks are they come from from germany and when it, when i got my first ones uh uh, in in Ohio, it is like an Amish uh, hardware store. Um, they gave me a set of recipes, and I have a friend who's from Germany. I'm like, I, I can't. Re it's all in German. I mean, all the recipes were uh, in <laughs> German. I mean, some things I could I could figure out, but uh, uh, they will actually when they ferment. Um, I think it's actually their pickle recipe. They actually put uh, either buttermilk or whey. So there's actually a milk product in the fermentation and, and that's supposed to help uh, accelerate too. And there's another thing too, I, I've been talking about adding the salt to this. You can actually buy a lacto-fermented uh, starter kit and it doesn't have all the, all the salt, uh, it wouldn't have as much salt in it. But, uh, and that's the thing too, this is all considered lacto-fermentation. Mm -hmm. So by adding that quantity of salt, it will kill off any other 
bacteria and yeast and things that are that naturally are on the vegetables. You. Right. And the lacto the lactobacillus is actually the fermentation that you want. So the lacto bacteria will live in that concentration uh, of salt, but it will kill off uh, any other um, uh, any other uh, pathogens, let's say, that uh, that might be in it. And, and honestly, too, I know some people say, oh, I opened it up and there was like white mold on it and stuff like that. And these, these recipes, they say, you just skim that off. And, mm-hmm. and in fact, there, there's one recipe, I probably shouldn't even say this, but uh, there's a recipe in here for fermented tomatoes. And they oh. say you just put your tomatoes in the crock and just like smash them up with a spoon. And they say you, you ferment for a week. But they said every once in a while you open it up and look in and if there's a white film on the top, like white mold on top, they say you just stir that in. Oh, really? But then after one week, you add salt and black pepper to that, blend it in, and they, I, I did it before, and I put it into uh, like salad dressing bottles, and uh, they say just top it off with about an inch of oil uh, after you're done. They said put a lid on it, but don't don't keep it, they, they said put cellophane over it, so I put cellophane with a lid loose, and uh they said that in there, they say you can keep that in a cool closet and it'll keep for up to a year. And they said you use it for sauces or uh, you know, salad dressings and stuff like that. And uh, I will say a client of mine, uh, retired now from the health department, told me when I told him that recipe, he said, Bill, he says, you tell me when you eat that stuff. He says, and I'll count the days until you die. And, <laughs> and I, I've eaten it and I'm still here. I've done it, done it for you years. You didn't think it was safe then. No, apparently not. But uh, so. I mean, it does have a little bit of a funky, like a, a little bit of a spoiled tomato taste. But uh, And I suppose, too, I mean, if you wanted to make a, a spaghetti sauce or something like that, you could cook it and mm-hmm. uh, kill all those dangerous things that could kill you in it but uh, like I said I, I, I've eaten it um, and you know some like I said some of the things I think in our world today we aren't used to this kind of preparation so we don't really understand it whereas you know people of the past that's how they that's how they lived I mean obviously you know canning's only been around for 150 years maybe well, freezing what like 70 80 years or something like that so people that needed uh, to, people that lived um, in northern in the northern part well the far south too when you talk about the southern hemisphere but People that lived in areas where there was winter, the only way uh, many years ago that they could have vegetables uh, was if they did this. Well, I I did read someplace, I can't remember where this was years ago, and they talked about like how um, asparagus was so coveted and there there was some sort of a festival, I don't know if it was in Greece, Somewhere where they they where it was warmer temperatures, but they wanted to preserve asparagus for this summer feast or, or whatever it was, and they they literally would harvest it and race the chariots like up into the mountains into some, and they would take it into some cave so they could uh, they could preserve the asparagus oh. for uh, for for a later time. But uh, uh, obviously, a lot of work to preserve some asparagus <laughs> that way. But uh, I know. But you know, and then then too, like you said, like in in the south, you know, where it's warmer. I mean, a lot of uh, preserving would be done by drying. So mm-hmm. uh, dried, you know, even mm-hmm. I, I know, well, it's not even in the South, but like in Scandinavia, they would they would catch cod. And you may have seen where they've got these big wooden drying racks and they would fillet the cod and they would dry it. So they have, you know, dried fish uh, in the in the winter months. But, uh, um, which, you know, I mean, obviously many, many different methods of, uh, of preservation. But, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I actually have brewed my own beer for years and uh, again another type of fermentation but um, oh I want to say it was about eight years nine years ago I wanted to make chicha which is the Peruvian beer of the Andes and uh, it's made with primarily corn well uh, you may not believe but it's really really hard to find whole kernel organic corn unless you buy like a 50 pound bag so the next year I grew my own corn and it was certain varieties that were made for that but in Peru what they do after the well and it, there's a couple different methods to brew it but they make a frutilada which they add strawberries to it and they bury the beer oh, in God. the ground to keep it cool to eat well it. we have come to the end of I another figured. episode of fresh perspectives it's been really interesting and I hope some of you out there are going to try making your own fermented vegetables. I'll see you in a couple of weeks.